Hallelujah. Praise God. Are you excited? You've received mercy? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Welcome to church. Choir, thank you. I mean, the guy who really sang this song originally will be amazed. I was feeling you guys. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Sister Ifi, God bless you, man. You are too much. <laughs> Praise God. All right, let's get into the word. I trust God for <laughs> grace to do a quick work. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Philippians 3, 12 to 15. The Bible says, Paul speaking, give me the King James Version, please. The Bible says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13 says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That means to lay hold of something. He says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul is saying that there was a reason why in all the wisdom of God, he orchestrated every single thing to lay hold on us as the saints. He says that reason, he's pursuing that reason and trying to lay hold of the reason. Meaning God laid a hold of you so that you could lay hold on something. Now, there is a very important concept, and you'll be seated very soon. A very important concept I would want the media team to help me project, and I pray it is clearer than this. Um, thank you. It's called the golden circle concept. Now, what this concept teaches is that if you want to really walk in the fullness of anything in life, you must always start with what is in the center, or your why, meaning the reason. Once you do not understand the reason for something, there is a very high tendency that you would not operate in that thing fully. It's until you've understood your why, then the how would make sense. And what you are laying a hold of or pursuing would then make sense. This morning, I'm going to be talking about the why, the how, and the what of the meaning of the verse we just read. I've titled this message, The Lordship of Jesus. Please, you may be seated. The Lordship of Jesus. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you start reading from verse 17, where Pastor Ebele left off in the first service, <laughs> the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Ah. You see, he says he is a new creature. You know, a creature is something that looks strange, isn't it? I'll leave that for you to think about, right? But it's a new creature. It actually meant it. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, brand new. Verses 18. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verses 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Meaning God has given us a ministry. So you see, when you get born again, there is a ministry that has been committed into your hands. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. And to be effective in that ministry, God has given us the word of reconciliation. Verses 20 now says something extremely powerful. He says, now then, so after you understand all of this, that your purpose, the purpose of God for getting you saved is to reconcile the world to him. 
He says, after you understand that, then it's important you know that you are now an ambassador for Christ. And he says, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So he says that we are ambassadors, talking about our identity. You know, when you do not know who you are, it is the worst form of crisis. Lots of people are living life suboptimally because they do not know who they are. He says we are ambassadors for Christ. And I like the fact that the Bible uses the word ambassador because the word ambassador is a very familiar word to most of us, if not all of us. Now, one of the master's degrees I did was in international law and diplomacy. And one of the courses they taught us was the role of the ambassador, who an ambassador is. And I think it deepened my understanding of this verse. Now, an ambassador is an individual sent from his home country to another country called the host country. Now, this person is there to do two things. Somebody say two things. Number one, to represent his country in this host country. Number two, to promote the interests of his country in this host country. Meaning, when an individual is an ambassador, this individual is not living, pursuing his own, our own agenda. They are existing in the host country to pursue the agenda of the country they came from. Now, as an ambassador, one of the things that happens to the person is that, number one, this person practically lives off the economy of his country, even though he or she is in another country. So the ambassador of the U.S. to Nigeria lives in Nigeria, geographically speaking. However, the house where this ambassador lives, if anybody commits a crime, a Nigerian commits a crime, and that Nigerian is able, by some stroke of luck or magic, jump into the compound where the ambassador's house is, the Nigerian government would have to speak to the U.S., and ask for this person to be submitted and given to them. They would not say this is Nigeria now and just walk in. They cannot do that. Because it is accepted and understood under international law that that area where the ambassador lives is the jurisdiction of America. Same thing with their embassy. The embassy of the US in Nigeria is not Nigeria. So for those of you who are saying you've not traveled out before. If you've entered any embassy, you've traveled out. <laughs> so just be entering lots of embassies. <laughs> Praise God. But I mean, according to international law, that is the reality. And ambassadors exist in the host country to what? Represent and promote. And Jesus, in his wisdom, inspired the Apostle Paul to use the same words. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Meaning we are representing Christ everywhere we go. And number two, we are promoting Christ. We are promoting the kingdom we came from everywhere we go. And in everything we are involved in. Now what does this mean? You see, in the, a very popular verse, Micah chapter 2. And if you are a member of the household of David, we quote this scripture. Micah 2, right? Sorry, Micah 4, Micah 4. Micah 4 says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it. When the Bible talks about the mountain of the Lord, what is it? The mountain. It says the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted, established, in the top of the mountains. What is the Bible talking about? When you read mountains in the Bible, it's talking about stability, it's talking about a pillar, right? You could, in this context, it is talking about the pillar of the society. There are various pillars of society that define what happens in a given territory. For example, right? Arts and entertainment is a mountain. A man by the name 
Johnny Enloe, wrote a very powerful book that I recommend to you to read, titled The Seven Mountain Prophecy. And what he was explaining in that book is that you have one, the mountain of arts and entertainment. Now, what is happening is that you look at what is happening in arts and entertainment today, and to a large extent, it is the devil that is having a few day there, right? Where are the ambassadors that are to go into that sphere and influence that sphere for Jesus? We have the mountain of education. We have the mountain of economy. All of you in business. All of us in business. You know, how are you running your business? I'm still going to come back to a few things. We have the mountain of family. We have the mountain of religion. You look at the world today and the kinds of policies and philosophies being propagated are destructive to families. And we think it is normal. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14. I mean, if I were to summarize it, it says we've been translated from the power of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Meaning that we are ambassadors from that kingdom. And it is our responsibility to ensure that in every mountain, media, every mountain, science, medicine, every mountain, that Jesus is established and Jesus is enthroned in that mountain. You know, before, when wars happened between countries, what used to happen is they used bow, arrow, they used sword, shield, all of those things. You know, after a while, the sophistication happened, start using bombs, guns, you know, missiles, atomic bombs, and all of that. Today, the most powerful weapon in the arsenal of the devil is our philosophies and policies. Devil is ensuring that he shapes policies, puts his people in places that shape policies that influence the way you and I would live. Mm. And if you look at it very carefully, all of these policies and philosophies are anti-God. The goal of these policies, the goal of these philosophies, these ideologies, is to ensure that it is the devil and his will and agenda that is reigning in all of these areas that I've mentioned. But you see, there is a reason why we are here. We are here to establish the kingdom in all of these spheres of life. But you see, I have discovered something very interesting. Matthew chapter 6. We would not be effective, and, and this is the reason why lots of Christians are not effective doing this. Matthew 6 verse 10. Jesus, what people call the Lord's Prayer, but Jesus was just talking about prayer. I believe John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. Verse 10 says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on in earth, rather, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Meaning that God's kingdom has to spread. The Bible talks about it in Isaiah chapter 11. He says, I think verse 9 thereabout, he says that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Meaning in every sphere of existence, Jesus would be crowned Lord. Jesus will be crowned ruler. And it's the ideas and ideologies of Jesus that would reign in all of these spheres of influence. And that is our assignment. Saints, that is our assignment. But one of the reasons why saints are not effective, and I want to dwell on that as, before I close. Romans chapter 12. So you see, the Bible talks about Thy will be done on earth, or in earth rather. There's a difference between on earth and in earth. He says, in earth as it is in heaven. Meaning it is God's desire that in every sphere of existence, in your business, in my business, in your office, in Nigeria, in any geographical space you find yourself, it is God's desire that in the educational field that his will is the one reigning 
Every country has something they call national interest. <laughs> and every policy is shaped by their national interest. It's God's desire that it is his will that would reign. But you see, in the book of Romans chapter 12, this was a verse that we delved into a while, some weeks back. You know, the Bible starts out by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, only acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The word will comes in here again. Why? Because you see, the individual, the believer who is going to establish the kingdom of God in any sphere of life must be one who understands the lordship of Jesus. The unbeliever's greatest problem or problems are sin and self. The believer's greatest problem is self. Self. If I ask you today, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Before you answer that question, think properly. Because to lots of believers, Jesus is their Savior, but is not yet their Lord. Lord means he's the master. Lord means he's the boss. Lord means he's the owner. Is Jesus really the master of every area of your life? Or you've just given him a part of your life? Is Jesus the Lord of your time? How do you spend your time? You go to the office, eight hours, nine hours, depending on where you work. <laughs> and you spend a lot of time because, I mean, you are, you are giving them time so that you can earn money. And that is not a bad thing. But how much time have you given to God that day? Is Jesus the Lord of your time? Is Jesus the Lord of your talent? Your giftings? What are you using your giftings to do? Is it to show people? Is it to make yourself just happy? God is not averse to us having money. And please understand me. I mean, in this ministry, we believe that it is God's will that Christians prosper. But why do you want to prosper? Your business, what is the end game of that business? What is the goal of that business? Is that business promoting the agenda of the kingdom? Or is that business promoting your personal agenda? You know, there are people who... Jesus is a part and is Lord of some parts of their lives. They've not given him some other parts. Those parts belong to them. And you see, until Jesus is the Lord of every area of your life, he's not Lord indeed. And you see, I, I, I perceive, and you see, as, as I pray, and that's why I read that scripture to us, in the last days, there is something God wants to do with the saints in the last days. We think we've seen wisdom, we've not seen anything yet. We think we've seen power, we've not seen anything yet. We think we've seen favor, You've not seen anything yet. But you see, the Christian that God will use has to be the one who is totally yielded to God. Spirit, soul, and body. The person the Bible calls a living sacrifice. Do you know what a living sacrifice is? You see, most sacrifices are dead. But when the Bible uses the word living sacrifice, that means this sacrifice can roll off the altar. <laughs> but you see, the sacrifice stays there. This was the same thing that Jesus was going through in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he says, Father, not my will, but thine. You see, when Jesus is Lord of your life, you've lost the ability to say no to him. You've lost the ability to say no. You understand that in this kingdom, we are only stewards. There is only one owner, and he's the Lord himself. 
You are living every area of your life. In your talk, is Jesus the Lord of your talk? Or, without mentioning names, some secular musicians are the Lord of your talk. You say, how do I know if Jesus is Lord? If you still think that you need their help to make it in your business, then they are the Lord, actually, of that business. And you see, whatever has not been committed to God, God is not committed to it. Is Jesus the Lord of your thought life? Ah, self is one of the biggest challenges and issues of believers. Self. Ah, no wonder Dusi Oyeko sang that song, Leave me at the altar with my father. And then there is this song. He says, you're all I want. He says, you're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are here. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Or is only your Savior? Is Jesus the Lord of your treasures? Your money? You see, do you know there are people that walk the face of this earth and they are willing to die for what they believe, as wrong as it is? Strap a bomb on their body and go blow themselves up somewhere because they believe it. To them, what and whoever they believe is Lord of their lives. They are ready to do anything for that person. Then you find believers. They are not ready to die oh, for this gospel. <laughs> Saints, for us to be seated in church today, has it ever occurred to you that some people died? Do you know that all the disciples, all the apostles, as you might call them, Jesus' apostles, go read history. Some of them were sawn into two. Peter was crucified upside down. <laughs> For us to have this gospel that we have today. If they didn't do the things that they did, we might not be here preaching. Ah, Is Jesus the Lord of your life? What are you willing to die for? What you are willing to die for would determine what you are willing to live for. If you understand what I just said, you write it down and think about it. Forget all the good suits, all the good ambience and all of this. At the end of the day, it's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. Is Jesus being glorified in your office? You know, today you find Christians who become philosophical. They, I mean, they just escaped out of the country all of a sudden. They become very philosophical. So, you know, um, we are speaking on behalf of those that are, you know, the, those marginalized. You know, I, what the Spirit of God is talking to us is beyond church. My brother, the church is the greatest weapon of God on the face of the earth today. So, let nobody deceive you. And there is nothing beyond the church. Jesus said it. He says, I will build my church. If you fight the church, you fight Jesus. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? That's what I'm asking you this morning. You know, this message, I, 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 I wanted to talk to you about the favor of God. You'll be very excited. But you see, if you don't understand what I am talking about, all of that favor won't work. As a matter of fact, the reason why a lot of people are still struggling and living under the economy of labor and not the economy of favor is because they do not understand the lordship of Jesus. Jesus is not lord of their lives yet. Is Jesus, you see, is there anything that you cannot live? Anything you cannot live. My wife knows. And it's, you see, that why our marriage is so wonderful is because the number one person in my heart is Jesus. The number one person in our heart is Jesus. So it makes life very easy for us. 
I remember many years ago, many years ago, as an, uh, sometimes it is just little, little things. Many years ago, I had this thing with watches. Ah, I could spend any amount buying any watch. I'm telling you, as I'm not very wealthy as I was physically at that time, <laughs> I would spend, I mean, I liked watches. But you know, when God started to deal with me, I would come to service, and God would say, uh, you know, say, say, Joshua, can you give me a sacrifice? And I would say, yes, Lord, how much? He say, no, the watch. I say, which one? This one. <laughs> you say, yes, the watch. I say, okay, no problem. I'll give it and buy another one. So I'll give it. And I'll go and buy another one. And then it happened for one month. I will come to church. And as I'm worshiping, you say, as you are giving your offering, also drop the watch. I say, ah, the watch. I say, okay, I say, God, nah, watch is not a problem. But I say, no problem. I'll just be giving it. After a while, I died to watches. <laughs> I like them, but there is nothing I can give. There was also a time, you know, I and my wife, it started happening when God started to bless us more, small, and somehow we started to get dollars, you know? And God would say, after we've saved the dollars, saved the dollars, you know, you're looking at the exchange rate. I said, yeah. <laughs> and God would say, drop everything. The, it's the dollar. I don't want the naira. It's the dollar. <laughs> Say, ah, God, you can take the naira now. <laughs> there is nothing. I, re, I remember one day, and pastor tells the story of how he saved money. He and Pastor Abby saved money, and they bought a car. I mean, so I, I was one of those privileged to drive the car from Magodo Gates to the house that day. It was very good feeling was in, um, um, uh, was, um, Paj um, well, um, what, Montero Sport, no, Montero Limited Edition, Oxblood, beautiful car, drove the car, <laughs> drove the car to the house, <laughs> to the house, our pastor came out, looked at the car, said, yeah, this, 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 I think, I think prior to that time, we are using Elantra, yeah, so, I mean, Limited. I mean, God is good now. Pastors should look good, right? <laughs> and, well, you know, I didn't know what happened in the room. It was later on they told us what happened in the room. <laughs> the next morning, I just saw pastor just dressed up, carried his bag, everything. He said he's going to come. I said, oh, really? Okay, sir. I said, sir, what about the plate number? He said, no, don't worry. We are I'm taking the car like that. <laughs> And the funny thing was that he hadn't even finished paying for the car. I mean, they are, they, I think they still had about 600000 or something to pay for the car. And God said, give it. You cannot imagine how many cars pastor has received in his life. Cars mean a lot of times when he buys a new car, it is the sons of the prophets that drive the cars. We are the ones that enjoy the car before he even drives it. Saints, I want to ask you a very simple question this morning. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? And I'm talking about everything. 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 Someone said, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. And that is the truth. Some of you are afraid that if you give, if you say, Lord, anything, you know, because sometimes it's not always money. The first sacrifice he wants is you. So you say, Lord, I give you everything. You are afraid that God is just going to organize some things you do not like. Say, Lord, everything. And he says, go and marry that sister. Say, eh, that one. <laughs> But listen to me. God is too organized to mismanage your life. There is one goal, and that is the kingdom. Everywhere that you operate, the kingdom of God, the will of God, the interest of our kingdom must be manifested there. 
If it is not, you are living suboptimally as a believer. And trust me, any Christian who allows the will of God to be manifested fully in their lives and through their lives, in any sphere of influence that they are operating in, they are the ones that see the greatest levels of power and the greatest levels of wisdom and the greatest levels of wealth. Be like Abraham. Lay it all at the altar. Lay yourself first. Be a true living sacrifice and die daily to yourself. Let Jesus be Lord indeed in your life. Can you rise up on your feet this morning? I want us to pray a very simple prayer. Say, Father, anything that has been standing in between you and me, anything that has been standing in between your lordship in my life, Lord, this morning I repent and I ask you to take it all away. I surrender all is not a song for only unbelievers. It's a song for even believers. I surrender all this morning. I surrender all this morning. My business, my family, Jesus will be Lord indeed. Lord indeed. Lord indeed. He'll be the one directing our lives. He'll be the one that we live for. Every job that I get, I would ensure the kingdom of God is promoted through that job. My business, I would ensure the kingdom of God is promoted through my business. Through my career, as I rise in my career, I will ensure the kingdom of God is promoted more and more. Because Jesus is Lord of all. He's Lord of my life entirely. Without any part missing. Lord, I repent for all of the times I've enthroned anything else above you. Might be my husband, might be my wife, might be my children, might be my job, might be my business, anything, my career, anything, my political ambition, anything I have enthroned above you. I put you first. You are the center. I do not have a plan B. I do not have any plan B. You are my only plan. Even when it looks like, I am not saying it is, but even when it looks like things are not looking good, you are still Lord of my life. And I live in absolute surrender to you. I repent this morning from making and prioritizing anything else above you. You are my priority. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Come on, somebody shout, Jesus is Lord of my life. He's Lord of everything. Thank you, Lord. Someone excited? Are you sure you're excited? Hello, thank you for watching us. We don't want this to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You know, um, after listening to God's word like this and you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's an opportunity to come to him and it's a simple process because he has made all things available. I want to employ you now to give your heart to Christ. And by saying these words, because giving your heart to Christ must be done consciously, he has paid the price. Say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you shed your blood for my justification. I accept your finished work right now and I confess that you are the Lord of my life. I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus. If you have said those words, you are actually born again, a new creation in Christ. Join us for more of this. God bless you.